Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It's Rebecca Liebes coming to you from San Diego, and we're going to study Torah together. Today, we're in the portion of scripture called Balak, and it's in the book of Bamidbar or Numbers. And there's a lot to get through today, so I'm going to get started right away. And before I do, I just want to remind everybody to um, subscribe to this channel and share it with your friends and family and help them link the Old Testament to the New Testament. Be a bridge, be a spark. Okay, so let's get started. So today's parasha, as I said, is called Balak. And his name is interesting. It means to destroy. And uh, I'm going to be going into that more in a minute. So I'm not going to spend any more time on that. But we're beginning in Numbers 22, verse 2, through uh, chapter 25, verse 9. And here's references in the prophets and the writings and in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, where it gives similar topics uh, if you want further study. So who was Balak and why should I care? Well, you're going to see spiritual principles here that are important that can be applied today to our own lives. And also this story points to Israel's past, present, and future. So let's get started. Who was Balak? When the Moabites, now remember, they had last week, they had traveled and they were now, they had to go around the Amorites. They wouldn't let them come through. And now they're camped on the plains across from Jericho. And so the Moabites had already heard about the Israelites and what they had done to the Amorite kings. So what they were going to do is the Moabites were going to seek an alliance with the Midianites south of them. Now, perhaps hoping for support since Moses had been married to the Midianite family by marrying Zipporah or Zipporah. So let's review. When Abraham rescued Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot, remember, ran to a cave with his two daughters. And during one of those nights, the girls got their father drunk and they wanted to have him be the progenitor of their families since there were no men with them. And so these two daughters of Lot became the Moabites and the Amorites. So they were the children out of this big hot mess that came out of um, Sodom and Gomorrah. So now we're seeing the same groups of people coming now, causing trouble years later in the plains of across from Jericho. Now, let's look at this picture a minute and I want you to get a visual. Uh, I'm a visual learner and I, I know many of you are too, to where we are in the stories. Now, the Moabites were right here the kingdom of Moab. These were the Ammonites, and they were already defeated when Israel had just fought the king of Og in the area of Bashan or Syria, and um, the king Sihon. And so the Moabites heard about this, and here's where the Israelites are right here, the plains of, um, this is actually right here. This is Jericho on the other side of the Jordan, and they're here right in these plains between um, the Ammonites and the Moabites. So what did they do? They decided that the king, who was called Balak, he had actually come from Midian before he was king of Moab. I find this interesting. And there's a lot more to read about this, and I, I've included some additional um, study on this and towards the end of this, and you can read more about what the sages say about Balak and Bilam, who are in this story. It's fascinating. But anyway, um, Balak, his original name, when he had been in Midian, was Zur, and his name meant to be confined or to besiege. And then his name was changed when he became king of Moab, originally from here, but now king of Moab, his name was changed to Balak, which means to destroy. 
So nothing was good with this man. His name was very indicative of um, the kind of trouble that he'd be causing. Now, Israel, as I said, had just defeated two kings and were parked right here. And Balak feared that the Israelites would do to them what they did to these other strong nations. So they were going to appeal to their neighbors in Midian. Now, the Midianites were natural enemies um, of the Moabites, but they were hoping to make them allies and come up against the Israelites right up here. So that's the setting of where we are geographically and historically in this story. Now, who is Bilam, or we call him Balaam, but his Hebrew name is Bilam. So he was from Midian, this area south of Moab up here. He was a descendant, actually, of Laban. Now, remember who Laban was. Laban is Moses' father-in-law. And he had, men, remember, many of the pagan idols in his home. And Moses ran from Egypt when he had killed that man, and he ran to um, uh, the Midianites. And he met Laban, and he actually married and stayed there, married his daughter Zipporah. So maybe they thought, hey, um, maybe this will be good for us if we make um, an alliance with Moses' people. So he goes and asks them to help. All right, so Balaam was raised in the occult and in witchcraft, and just like his grandfather. So Balaam was actually the grandson of Laban. Isn't that interesting? So Balaam also knew about pagan practices. Now, Mount Peor, which is in this story, was one of the high places for occult worship. And this is where they would put up their Asherah poles and they would sacrifice children. And this is where a lot of pagan practices with the temple prostitutes that would go on in these pagan high places. So according to the Zohar, which are the mystics, the Hebrew mystics, that's their book, Zohar, Bilam had prophesied that Balak would become king of the Moabites. So Bilam had some supernatural uh, prophecies that predicted that Balak would actually be king. So they said about Balaam that he could predict things and curse things based on his words. Now we're going to look at that in a minute. And he also, they also said he had an evil eye. So wherever he looked, then his mouth would curse. Now this is important because it's opposite of what um, Moses would do, right? For good, Bilam would do for evil. So this is a, a conflict between Moses and Bilam. So let's look briefly at this history here genealogically. Remember, Terah was Abraham's father, and he married Sarah, and then he, they had Isaac. Isaac married Rebekah. They had Jacob and Esau. Okay, and then from there, the tribes came Moses, and then they were down in Egypt. Okay, so where does Balak and Bilak come in? Well, they're way back up here, where Abraham had brothers, okay, Nahor and Haran. So look, Nahor, all the way down through the generations, we get to Bilam, and from Haran, through Lot, we get the Moabites and the Amorites, and from them comes Balak. Now, there's a huge history, and as I said, I'm going to be giving you um, more to read if you're interested. But this is not just myth or stories or um, traditions passed down that we're to believe. I, I just put a couple things in here because they have found inscriptions on stones in Jordan. And on it is writings about Bilam, son of Beor. And see, look, Bilam um, actually came from Beor right here. So they have found writings on stone about these exact things. And Bilam's gods 
were of the goddess Ashtar. Remember I said the Ashtar, Ashtara poles? Well, here it is written on stone in Jordan. And then they also found the Moabite stone, which they can trace back to some, sometime around 840 to 830 BC. And it's written in the early Proto-Canaanite language. And it talks about um, the kings of Moab in Israel, etc. So these were actual places, not just myths. So in this story, as I said, this is going to be Moses and the Israelites against Balak, the Moabite, and Bilam from Midian. So who's going to be in charge? And we'll see at the end of the story. Now, it's interesting that Balak, even though um, his name meant to destroy, Bilam is the, another magician from Midian. And look at his name, Bilam. We call him Balaam. But we're going to break down these two names because I want you to see something important in Hebrew. Whenever you see these two letters, the bait or the vet, same word, bet and vet, one has a dot in and that's a B sound. And if there's no dot, it's a V sound, but it's the same letter. And then the L or the Lamed, whenever you see this combination of the B and the L, it isn't good. And I think it's interesting and fascinating that it's in both of their names. Here's the Bet and the Lamed, the Bet and the Lamed. So in these letters, they're actually also names. Every letter in Hebrew is also a name of something. So a bet is a house, and it's also the house of Jacob. So it would be the inheritance of Jacob or the next generations. So it can mean house or generations. And then lamed, lamad, means a teacher. A, a, a lamdim are teachers. And those who um, um, are students are called talmudim. And so... From there, you get authority or who is teaching you. So isn't it interesting that their names have these two letters, who is in charge and who is teaching the next generation? What you see in this story has huge implications for today and what this generation is being taught and who is their authority. So it does uh, swing into our current culture. So I want to give you some examples of words that are not positive when you get the wrong authority. Now, look, this is the word habal. Habal means vanity. And we get the word hevel from that. But they use the V here. Vanity, vanity, it means of no value. Or it means a brief breath. Isn't that something? So man is like vain imaginations. We're just like a breath. We have no real significance unless we can be mortal. And this is exactly what God did when he sent the Messiah to bring back um, immortality. And so habal or hevel is one negative word. Then look at this, bala. Bala means chaos. Now these words that I'm showing you are called family words because every three letter Hebrew root word has with it family words and it functions just like people. So I'm showing you the family words that share two of the genetics of the word, if you will, genetics, letters. So look, this word bala means chaos or decay. Bala is, is a sound alike, but it ends with a different letter. It means to wear out. Bala, again, there's three balas, but notice each letter at the end is different, but they share the B and the L. And it means to devour or calamity or to be swallowed up or consumed or to end. So none of these are positive. And then there's just a few more. By the way, this last one, bala, mean to devour or swallow up, is Bilam's name. And his mother called him Bilam because she was predicting he would swallow up other people or devour others with his mouth, cursing or blessing. So that's his name. So even in his name, you see that he's 
he's been told he's going to either curse or bless. That's his name. Okay, and then a few more here. Balal means to confuse. Babel means Babylon. That's where you get their name, where they were taken into exile. And we get Mabul. Here's the B in the L again. That's the flood that destroyed the whole world. And it also means to mix, because in a flood, everything's mixed. And then Abal is to lack wholeness, to mourn, or to destroy. So when you don't have the right authority, there's all this negativity. So what do all these words have in common? Well, something that is out of order or with negative outcomes. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about who's the authority over your house or whose voice or are, uh, is this group of people listening to? Is it going to be the cursing prophet, Balaam, or is it going to be the God of Israel? So that's the end of this story. That's the theme at the end. So Bilam knew about the God of Israel, and the sages suggest that God temporarily used him on his behalf. Now, Balak believed that Moses' strength was in his mouth, because anything he said would happen. Remember, Moses was a great prophet. Balak, the king of the Moabites, knew this about Moses. That's why he was so terrified of this people. So that's why he called on this mystic uh, occultist, Bilam, to come and use his mouth, then perhaps spiritual warfare, but in the occult. So interesting that Moses began, right, complaining to God that he was weak in tongue, yet everything he said God used to prove God's strength. So it's, it's an interesting twist in this story. So because of this, Balak sent elders, uh, all the big mucky mucks from the Moabites down to Midian to, to get Balaam and ask him to come and curse Israel using his mouth. So what happens? Balak's plan was to fight an unconventional war using witchcraft or curses. The Jewish rabbis say God may have done this, so that those who rejected the God of Israel, the Goyim, the nations, would be without excuse. See, because the pagan nations couldn't then say, well, if God had given us a prophet to Moses, you know, maybe we'd have listened to him. Maybe that's what the pagan nations would say, right? But um, it's interesting that the rabbis say no. No, God wasn't doing this so that the other nations could say, well, if we just had a prophet, we would listen to him because history has proven that in the future, they still didn't listen to the prophets, nor did they listen to the prophet that would fulfill all the prophet's words, which was the Messiah. So that wasn't uh, going to fly. All right. So in Deuteronomy 18, which is what we're going to be studying the next book, Moses spoke to the Israelites right before they entered the land of promise. Moses said, Adonai will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, the Israelites, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. And during Yeshua's ministry, the mixed multitude started out chanting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So they started out giving him the praise he deserved, the blessing. But in the end, what did he become? The curse. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So the mouths that started out blessing the Messiah would end up cursing him, and it would cause his death. But this was all part of God's plan. So um, this, too, is part of the story. So Balak tried to bribe him with gold and silver to come and curse Israel. And he even wanted to be assured that um, he'd be able to curse them. So he sent all these amulets to um, help curse, right? Here, I'm going to give you some more to help, you know, boost up your curses. And I'm, I'm just looking at this, thinking about a time when I was in nursing school. And I nurse in uh, UCLA. And... Uh, uh, one of the doctors had gone down to um, the Amazon 
And when he came back, he brought me this black fist and it's a, it's a witchcraft uh, voodoo fist. And I just being so naive, I wasn't even a Christian then. I called myself a Christian because I was born in my parents' household and they were Methodists. I'm gonna get to that in a minute too. But anyway, I put it on and I wore it around my neck. And do you know what? Everything bad happened to me from that point on. And it wasn't until I ripped it off and threw it in the fire and began to follow Jesus that my life made a turn. Isn't it interesting that in this story that this Balak from the Moabites wanted to also bring special charms it's going to make your life go better. Well, we see this today with the occult practices and divination and tarot cards and palm readers and, and all this crazy stuff that people are um, going to, to try to find spiritual uh, blessings and curses and try to figure out their lives. And so whose voice are they listening to and whose authority? That's a question you need to ask. So perhaps Bilam knew of the covenant promises that God had made to Abraham. After all, he was from that area. So remember what the promise was? I will bless those who bless you. And what? Curse those who curse you. So Bilam was a descendant, as I said. And Bilam said, I can't go beyond the word of Adonai, my God. So he was a real hypocrite. He was trying to act spiritual when he spoke to the people, but we all know that he has a terrible history and, um, and he was a hypocrite. He, he had money in mind. There were payoffs in his religious activity. And we see this too in our culture today and all through history where people in the name of Christianity and religion did horrible things, especially in the time of the Reformation and the Crusades and the pogroms and Hitler and all of that. So this is like shirt tail Christianity. That's what I say. People who claim to be one thing, they honor me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. And this is um, what many people do today. They claim to be Christians all through history, but their hearts didn't, um, follow. And Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit, if they're true Christians or not. And that goes in our culture today. Watch people's lives and look at the fruit that comes from them. Are blessings following their lives? Are people getting um, transformed by their lives? Are the words of Jesus being lifted up? Are Jesus' ways being lifted up? Uh, these are the fruits of the spirit that you should see in a true Christian's life. Joy, peace, kindness, patience, tolerance, gentleness, faithfulness, and what? Self-control. So when people claim to be Christians and they have no self-control and they're doing things that are um, anti what Jesus would teach then you have to ask yourself if they're really true Christians. So that's not up to me to decide. That's up to God to decide. I just throw that out there for uh, your own thought. Now, the first time Balak sent messengers to ask if he'd curse, Adonai said to Balak, no, do not go. Because Adonai told him, they are blessed, the people of Israel. The second time he sent more important people, this time, Adonai said to Bilam, go with them, but only say what I tell you to say. So Bilam agrees, and the next morning, he leaves on his donkey. Now, it's a female donkey. If you look the word up in the scripture, he went on his aton, which is a female donkey. I think it's interesting that her name, a female donkey, is aton. And without this donkey saying what she said, it actually atoned for Bilam's life. Um, just a little play on words that I noticed. And the male name for a male donkey is Hamar. And uh, it also means to be stubborn. And um, it's also the word for clay. Isn't that interesting? When it talks about God 
taking his hands and taking clay, which is stubborn, and then pressing it to, to get something positive out of it. See, God made man out of the dust. In other words, dust doesn't depend on water. It, it's not typically pliable, but in God's hands, he created man. And then after the fall, it says we were clay. In other words, stubborn. Same word for male donkey. So I just thought I'd throw those Hebrew words out. I find it fascinating. You'd never see that in English. So on the way, the female donkey, on the way to curse God's people, she sees an angel with a drawn sword standing in the path to oppose him. Now, in Hebrew, you wouldn't see this except in Hebrew. To oppose him, that word is Satan, but it's spelled with a samic instead of a sin, which is the other S letter in Hebrew, but it means to oppose, and it's the same sound-alike letter as Satan. Why? Because they're family sound-alikes. They share two of the same letters, the tet and the nun. So this is a, a sound-alike cognate word where Satan, see here spelled with a different letter, this is a sin, this is a sonic, and it is the word for the accuser. The accuser stands before God and opposes us, accuses us. So this is what Satan does. So here's this angel now, but for good is opposing um, Bilam. And the donkey sees it, the female sees it. I think this is interesting because um, the Holy Spirit is also uh, in the feminine form. And uh, spirit filled is many times what they call uh, the Hebrew rabbis acknowledge that women many times are much more spirit filled than the men. And uh, that's just something that the rabbis acknowledge. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out when you say, oh, yeah, the Bible's against women. I go, no, 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 no. That is not true. That is an anti-Semitic and anti-God comment. Um, anyway, let's look. She was standing there with a sword. Now that word, let's, let's look at some more fun words in Hebrew. Um, and the word for sword is cherev, het resh that okay and it means to lose vitality to create ruin or a drought so she's standing there with this cherev okay now a sound alike family phonetic word is cherev but with a kof instead of a het see the difference right here are these two letters but they're related how well to karav means to draw near, to approach. And so this is the root word for a korban, which is a sacrifice. So with our korban, we korav, we draw near. And look, it's a sister word to a sword because when you're going to bring death or threat, you bring a sword to protect. So we see a sword where? Where else? In the garden, an angel with a sword protecting the righteous of God, which is the garden, the holy place. So all these words are so important. If you reverse in Korav, you reverse those letters right here to draw near, and you just change it to uh, Karev, you switch it, look what you get the grave. So what does the Bible say? Don't add to my word. Don't take away from my word. Don't change my word. Don't switch around letters. Because what was meant to mean to draw near so that you could bring your sacrifice and be pleasing to God would actually be like a grave and bring death like the cherev or sword. See how these are all related. And what do they share? The, the resh and the bet. The first or highest of the house. Isn't that interesting? That's what these letters meant. Resh means high or head, head of something. And bet is the house. So 
we draw near to see who's going to be head. And again, these are all pictures in the story of who's in charge. Okay, so when the donkey left the path, Bilam became angry and started beating her. But once back on the path, she sees the angel a second time and moves aside to avoid the angel with the sword. And the Talmud says that the donkey tried to avoid the angel and sword and Bilam's foot began crushed against a wall and actually made him lame. Isn't that interesting? Oh my gosh, there's so much tied to this story. To be lame is the same word to limp is Pesach. And so remember, I said that um, the word atone is a female donkey that saved Bilam's life. Well, he became lame because of her. And that's what Pesach comes from, Pesach. The, word, the verb pasuk, which means to limp or to pass over or to skip. Because when you limp, you walk with an altered gait. And so um, anyway, isn't this fascinating, these stories? You've got to love this language and, and study your Bible. Even knowing a little bit of Hebrew makes all the difference in the world. So then the third time the angel of the Lord moved ahead of them and actually got in a place where it was impossible to avoid anymore. So this is very much like our lives. God keeps warning us, warning us, warning us. And then something suddenly happens and suddenly you're stuck. I love the suddenlies of the Bible. Suddenly everything changed. And that's exactly my story. Driving on the freeway, suddenly my eyes were opened and I saw everything differently. So anyway, she came to a place where it was impossible to go any farther. The donkey saw the angel and what did it do? It said she sat down, but if you look up the word in Hebrew, it said she bowed down. Wow, this female donkey had the sense to know that she was standing in the presence of the Almighty, this angel. Some people say it was the Lord himself. So Bilam became so angry, he started beating her with the stick. This too is significant because here's this female donkey trying to save his life by warning him and he still doesn't listen. And now he starts beating the one who was gonna save his life. See any uh, connections there? Jesus riding in on a donkey, first saying blessings, then in the end he became the curse. Anyway, uh, he started beating her and then what happened? God opened her mouth to speak truth. Okay, so listen to what said what she says. She says the donkey to Bilam, I'm yours, right? I'm your donkey. I've been faithful to you all this time, right? Have I ever treated you like this before? Basically, she's saying, look, dummy, I've always been faithful to you. Why are you treating me this way? Why don't you listen to the female? This reminds me of Sarah. This reminds me of Rebecca. This reminds me of Rachel. This reminds me of Zipporah when it comes to he, Moses didn't uh, circumcise his son. God uses women in these men's lives for a reason. She's called an Ezer Konegdo, which is a helper. And so he's saying, she's saying, why aren't you listening to me? I want to give you spiritual insight. Okay. And so she has the sense to bow down and kneel. Now, Adonai opened his eyes and Bilam himself then saw the angel with the drawn sword and he bowed down with an act of submission. And I always say, was it really bowing down or was he scared to death and it just did a face plant, you know? But the Bible does say every day or someday, every knee will bow. So you can either bow early and follow Jesus or when it's too late and you try to bow and um, like that amulet, it'll be thrown into the fire. So he bowed down, it said, with his face to the ground. And in Hebrew, it says, Kadad Derek Af, which means he bowed his nose to the way. Isn't that interesting? So 
his nose is the same word for anger. So here he was in his anger, beating the one who saved his life. But one day he would bow to the one he was angry with. And this reminds me of the prophecy in Zechariah that says, someday they will look on the one they pierced and mourn. The one they were angry with and the one they cursed, they will bow down and kneel. So do you remember why he was angry? It says, you made a fool of me. So see, this is what is the problem when people don't want to bow to an authority that's over them. They want to be their own little God. They don't want to bow to anyone else's authority. I always say, you can't be Jesus alone. You can't follow him alone until you're willing to give up your throne. So you can either be alone and live your own life and be your own God, or you can be willing to die to yourself, give up your throne and follow Jesus. He said, if you're not worthy uh, to follow me, if you can't give up mother, father, sister, belongings, everything, anything, all things to follow him. So again, their ego and pride are involved. And this is exactly what comes out of his mouth. Why? Because even though he claimed to be a follower, God, my God, remember, his heart was far from God. And so his ego was injured in front of his servants. And this led him from anger to aggression. So in your pride, your own God and lordship, when people confront you with your bad behavior, what happens? You get angry. And then what happens? You get aggressive with your mouth. And this is exactly what we see here in this picture. This is so true in many relationships. Now, in 2 Timothy 3.8, there's a reference here in the Targum, Jonathan, that says, you hate truth like Jonas and Jambas, who opposed Moshe. And in the New Testament, um, in 2 Timothy, uh, the sages believe that, and the rabbis, the Messianic rabbis, that they were referring to, um, to Bilam. Bilam was one of these two that opposed Moses. They were sons of Bilam in Pharaoh's court and may have been present when Moses faced off with the magicians. And so they would have been maybe young and their father would have been older. So some people say that Bilam was in Pharaoh's court and that's why he was so revered in Midian. So interesting, all this history that you read about in the Targums and in the uh, Gemara and the Mishnah, the Talmud. So that's why I'm giving you some additional references at the end. So the angel asked, why did you hit me three times? Now pay attention to numbers, three, shalosh times, okay? This is the three foot feasts that they would take to go up to the temple, okay? He, she says, I came here to block you from cursing God's people, Israel. And if she hadn't done what she did, I would have killed you. This is what the angel is saying to Bilam. So remember, he beat her three times. So this number three, we're going to see come back in the story in the next slide. Perhaps the appearance of the angel three times and these three beatings look back to the three patriarchs who gave the promises to Israel in the first place. I will bless those who bless you and utterly destroy those who curse you. And Bilam was shown mercy here. And he finally said, I have sinned against you, Adonai. So he said, I'll go back if you want me to. Now, perhaps God knew what was truly in his heart. And that is why the scripture said God was angry, even though God had actually told him to go, because he knew Bilam's true heart. Some speculate that Bilam may have been from Aram, where originally uh, Moses ran. 
and knew all about Abraham and the blessings and the promises. So who knows? Sometimes people confess to knowing God. They want to be spiritual. If you say, oh, are you, are you a person of faith? And they'll say, oh, I'm spiritual. And then they'll list all the practices that they're into in their spirituality. And many, many times you'll hear them saying things about the occult and things that are anti-biblical. And what they do is they mix a little bit of religious activity with occult witchcraft type practices, and it becomes a mabul or a flood of deception. And that's exactly what is in the name of Balak and Bilam. So we see this today in our culture. So people say they want God, but they don't want to submit to his lordship. They, they mouth that they're Christians, but they will never give up their own throne. Do you want a throne of your own? Or do you want to be alone in the end? Or do you want God to own you? All those words rhyme, don't they? Okay, so Bilam then met Balak and perhaps still had his eye on the diviner's fee, the money. So it was a practice that was well paid for. Okay, people would go to places like the um, Baal and Mount Kior, and this is where they they talk to the spirits of the dead to try to find truth, and they were paid very highly. This was going on in Pharaoh's court when they left Egypt, right? So this is never good to follow these lying spirits. Okay, so but God can speak through anyone, even a donkey, and even a false prophet. So remember Saul and the witch of Endor. You can read about that in 1 Samuel if you remember that story. So he took him to the first high place. Okay. And they took him to Baal. And he saw part of the people. And he said, build me seven altars and prepare me seven bulls and seven rams. Now notice he's using the number seven. Seven is a number of completion. So this is almost like seeing the complete anti-God spirit, okay? He wants seven of everything, okay? A spiritual show off, basically. And we see this too in the church where people will claim these huge miracles are happening and it's really not. There's microphones behind the stage and false people being slain and objects supposed to bless people if you have one of these for $20 or your gift of $50. There's those people too. Okay, so instead of um, cursing him, what comes out of his mouth? He blesses them. And he says, they are a sanctified people. They're blessed by God. Who can count the dust of Jacob or Yaakov? Okay, so God is reminding the people of their past, the promises of the patriarchs, the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we see in the story, he sees three angels. He beats the donkey three times. And now there are these three blessings. Okay. And the first one speaks of Israel's past and covenant with Abraham. Then the second blessing, he takes him to a second place, a different location. And he takes him to the range of Pisgah, the most high place. Okay. And Balak again goes through all this with the sevens. And he, what does he say? Adonai's words are unchanging and eternal. Adonai's king of the earth. So he, what? He's, he's asking, this king is asking Bilam to bless them. So what does he approach? The present. He says, oh, God is king of the earth and this people are blessed. So he's speaking about their present victory over these false prophets. So he's speaking of the past. He's speaking of the present situation by referring to the king of the earth, and then look what happens. Then he takes them to Mount Peor. And this is exactly, by the way, the same mountain range that Moses dies on. And God buried him there. And so he takes them to this mountain and he looks out over the desert, Bamidbar. That's the book we're in, Bamidbar or Numbers. And he saw Israel tribe by tribe in tents. Now this is significant. He says again, build me these seven altars and sacrifices, blah, blah, blah. But this time, he didn't go and stand by the altar and use divination. It says the spirit of God came on him. And he says he looked and saw 
Now remember, they said Bilam had the evil eye. Whatever he looked at, his mouth would either curse or bless. So he says, when he saw them gathered tent by tent, tribe by tribe, this was prophetic. He did something different. His mouth just blessed without all the other hocus pocus. And it's a speech of a man, he says, who had eyes that have been open and who hears God's words. Okay, so he is now using a different tactic that is truly God led. And he says, How lovely are your tents, Yaakov, Jacob, your dwelling places. If you look at this word in Hebrew, this word dwelling places, You'll miss this if you don't read it in Hebrew, but dwelling places is the word mishkenotecha, mishkenotecha, and here it is, mishkenotecha, and the sages say it's alluding to the three future tabernacles or temples that would be future. So when he looked down and saw all the tribes See, some of the tribes, some of the people, but when he saw the big picture for the third time, third time's the charm, what? He said, I'm going to bless their tents and dwelling places. And this is a picture of the first temple, the second temple, and a future temple, which will be the third temple. And so this is a prophetic clue. And uh, look what it says here. That if you remember, he refers to Jacob here. Remember what Jacob was called in the beginning, way back in Genesis? It said Jacob was described as blameless and a dweller in the tents. Plural. See that connection back again to Jacob and tents? This is tying the blessing back to the patriarchs. And they said that he was a man who, who dwelt a blameless man. Tom is blameless a perfect man, a dweller of tents, Ochlim. So this is um, a beautiful reminder of the promise. So they would devour nations in the future. They'd be blessed. And he says, I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse Israel. I always say to everybody, keep your eyes on Israel. Those who bless Israel get blessed. And those that curse them and hate them and want them destroyed, you'll see in the end, they will be cursed themselves. It says they're going to be a place of healing. Uh, they're going to have strength. And they're going to thrive. They'll have plenty of seeds and water will flow there. This is what we're seeing again in Israel and people coming back there and making what was a desert thrive and now produce some of the highest quality of fruits and grains and wine. And, and uh, God is blessing Israel. Out of Israel is coming supernatural blessing. And then he says their king will be higher and it speaks of a future king or the Messiah who will be even greater than these three temples. So I'm going to wrap this up quickly. Here's where you can go to read more in the website hebrewforchristians.com. And if you'll just copy this and paste it, you can go read more about this in the history. And then um, it says that Balak, his fury blazed against Bilam and because he was blessed. And he said, no fee for you. And Bilam said, before I go, let me warn you. So Bilam is giving now a curse on Balak. He says, I see him speaking of this future king, but not now. I behold him, but not soon. A star will step forth from Jacob. A scepter king will arise from Israel, and his enemies will be his possessions. And from Jacob, Israel, will come someone who will rule. And the rabbis believe that the magi, these diviner of stars, actually came from the same area that Balak and Bilam came. They were from the east, see, from the Midianite people. And they were looking for this ruler that was predicted in this story of Numbers 24. And they were looking for the star that came from the mouth of Bilam. And that's where we get the Christmas story the baby being born in the star of Bethlehem, which is where Jesus was born.
So Israel's purpose was to be a light to the nations. And so what were they guided to? A light that stopped right over Bethlehem or Bethlehem, the single dwelling place where the baby would be born. This was God's covenant to have a place to dwell with his people. And the Messiah would be the one in the future who would come and die, be the curse, go back and take his blood to the holy tabernacle and then return the Holy Spirit to us to dwell in tabernacle within us. And this too is the blessing that would be promised in all the nations, all the goyim, would be blessed through this one who was promised. So the story ends with then the Moabite women then seducing the Israelite men. And once again, they fall into sin because of uh, beautiful women. They would set old women at tents and lure them in with occultic practices. But once they got in here, They'd have these dressed up women who were perfumed and all ready to seduce them sexually. And this is what's happening in our culture today, where men are, they see with their eyes and they're seduced with occultic things and occultic practices. Um, and they're seduced by women on the screens of the, every gym you go into with the music videos and everything we're seeing on TV and on the internet pornography, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens? Zimri comes in with this Moabite woman and takes her into his tent to have sex with her. And the high priest's son, Phineas, or Pinchas, then runs her through with a spear. And God said, I, I'm sick of these people. They're saying one thing, but their hearts are far from me. So he's going to get rid of all of them with a plague. And because Phineas runs in, we're going to go into this in more detail later. Um, this is where he runs in and stops the plague. Now, really quickly, uh, 24,000 people died right then. And that was 2,000 per tribe, by the way, um, that were being seduced by these women. So some from every uh, tribe, indicative of some from every nation. So when people go, oh, look at the innocent people, you know, what's happening to them? And I go, there are no innocent people in this world. We're all fallen. We all fall short. We're all broken people. We, you, you may compare yourself to other people and think, well, I'm not that bad. See, I'm not murdering people and looting and stealing and blah, 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 blah. But maybe you're stealing glance, glances at other women at your gym. And Jesus said, if you're lusting in your heart, you've already committed adultery. So don't think you're so wonderful and innocent when Jesus' standard goes to the heart and the mind. What's going on in here and in here, you're also, you might as well go do it. So just a word on that. So these, uh, these are some pictures uh, I found of the Moloch and these high places, the Baal temple worship. Did you know that there was actually a replica of this high place that was a worship temple and it was actually a traveling show? Can you believe that? It, it's been seen in New York, London, Washington, D.C., and Amsterdam. Here's a picture of the, um, the what it looks like now uh, as part of the uh, traveling occult show. And here's that pagan Ashtara, uh, the goddess of the pagan feast from the Middle East that arrived in London just in time for the ancient pagan festival. So you can go there and read about this that's going on all over the world. And uh, you can see why we're all in big trouble. Let me just end with Rabbi Sachs, who recently died. He was the chief rabbi in the UK. Here's what he predicted in 2011. This was the warning, people, the warning to the cultures of the world. A tsunami of wishful thinking has washed across the West, saying that you can have sex without the responsibility of marriage, children without the responsibility of parenthood, just abort it, social order without citizenship, liberty without the responsibility of morality, I can do whatever I want, and self-esteem without the re responsibility of work and earned achievement, not socialism, okay? 
He predicted this in 2011, and we're 11 years down the road. And look at our culture mess that we have today. So their wishful thinking has come to be our reality. People are like, what's happening in our world? I'm like, warning, 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 mercy, grace, mercy, grace. And then suddenly, everything will change and it'll be too late. So um, we see this in our culture. We see it in down in you know, Burning Man, where it has to do with fire and sexual immorality. We see it now uh, when people do this every year out in the desert. And even though he was considered an enemy of Israel, the words of Bilam's prophecy are really God's words and are read every day. Did you know this? In the Jewish synagogues around the world, when they quote the Matovu prayer, it's set upon entering the synagogue and realizing whose authority and presence you're standing in. And it's called the Matovu prayer. And you know how that prayer ends? Answer me with the truth of your salvation, which is the name of Yeshua or Jesus. They're ending their prayer with the exact word salvation, which is what Jesus would bring. He would be the true sacrifice. His blood would be perfect. And he would be the high priest, the mediator that would intercede between God and Israel. And now we as the Gentiles are grafted in to their tree of faith, and we stand on their shoulders, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that's where I'm going to leave it today. I hope that this has blessed you, and I hope that you run your race following the one who has the best interests uh, regarding you, which is um, Jesus of Nazareth. And I hope you'll share this with your friends and family members who um, don't know Jesus. And I pray that uh, you will share this, okay? So subscribe and pass this on and refer people to Sparky's Torah Time. Tell your churches, tell your pastors, tell your friends, tell your Bible readers, not so they can follow me, but that they can learn from our Jewish ancestors, the beauty of the Messiah. And be that spark. That's all I'm to do. Spark you. Spark you. Spark your interest. Okay, I'm going to let you go. I'll see you next time on Sparky's Tour Time.